So I'd like to begin our time together today by reading the University of Utah's recently adopted land acknowledgement. The University of Utah has both historical and contemporary relationships with indigenous peoples. Given that the Salt Lake Valley has always been a gathering place for indigenous peoples, we acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes, and is a crossroad for indigenous peoples. The University of Utah recognizes the enduring relationships between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We're grateful for the territory upon which we gather today. We respect Utah's indigenous peoples, the original stewards of this land, and we value the sovereign relationships that exist between tribal governments, state governments, and the federal government. Today, approximately 60,000 American Indian and Alaska Native peoples live in Utah. As a state institution, the University of Utah is committed to serving Native communities throughout Utah in partnership with Native nat nations and our urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. And now I have the great honor of introducing our guests to you. Um, you've already discovered that they're simply delightful people, um, but there's more. Uh, Professor Donald Rubin has graduate degrees from the University of Minnesota and SUNY Buffalo. He's currently an emeritus professor researcher in the Centers for Health and Risk Communication and Global Health at the University of Georgia, where he was a professor in the departments of speech communication and language and literacy education, in addition to the program in linguistics from 1978 to 2007. It's hard to overstate the impact of Professor Rubin on the intersecting disciplines that he has engaged with over his career. His publications spanning the fields of public health, communication, second language acquisition and bilingualism, and social psychology, and I'm sure I've missed some. Professor Rubin is well known for his seminal work beginning in the late 1980s and early 1990s that emphasized the two-way nature of communication among native and non-native speaking interlocutors in particular in the context of instruction provided by international teaching assistants at U.S. universities. Professor Rubin's methodologically and analytically sophisticated early work in this area drew our attention to the role that native English speaking students' expectations regarding the speech of those they have assigned a non-native speaker status hindered their ability to understand that speech independent of the acoustic phonetic properties of the speech itself. We're fortunate to be joined today also by Professor Okin Kang, who has graduate degrees from the University of Auckland and the University of Georgia, where she completed her doctoral thesis working with Professor Rubin in 2008. She's a professor of applied linguistics and teaching English as a second language at Northern Arizona University, where it apparently has also recently started snowing, where she also directs the Applied Linguistics Speech Lab. Her research concerns speech production and perception, second language oral assessment and automated scoring, language attitudes, world Englishes, and L2 phonology. Her publication record documents a breathtaking level of scholarly productivity. And I have always particularly been awed by Professor Kang's ability to bring together a robust research program on second language speech with a commitment to exploring the instructional and institutional implications of her research. I'd like to add that this colloquium today is especially exciting for me as this fall's capstone students are conducting replication studies of work by professors Rubin and Kang, and I could not be more delighted to bring together our experienced researcher guests and our emerging researcher capstone students at this event. I hope you will appreciate, as I do, the very special opportunity we have today to learn from these two who have come together to provide us with historical and current perspectives on the interplay of listener bias and the properties of second language speech in communication. Please join me in welcoming Professors Kang and Rubin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and I think the story might be different for Okim. But for me, uh, what you've just heard from Professor Hayes Harb, you can pretty much turn off your Zoom right now. You've heard it all. Um, that's pretty much all I've got to say. Uh, but uh, truly, I do want to say that the honor is, is ours. Um, we feel, uh, I, uh, speaking for myself and I think for Okim, that uh, 
Uh, it's a great honor to be invited to come and speak to the University of Utah, the linguistics program. There's a lot of great and exciting stuff going on in the linguistics department at Utah. And, and I've learned so much uh, by meeting some of the folks and perusing uh, some of the materials that are available. Um, you know, I would like to sit in on your uh, symposia and hear about some of the work that you all are doing. Uh, I'm really curious about um, to hear more from Professor Jarvis, for example, about his work on uh, the comprehension, how comprehension of uh, 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 warning, uh, criminal warnings in criminal uh, apprehension settings. It's something that I have not actually worked on, but there are some folks in Canada that have been building on some of the work we've done on listenability. Um, uh, that uh, uh, makes me curious to hear about the work he's been doing and uh, Dr. Santos' work. Um, uh, I noticed that there's a paper, a recent paper that looks at computational linguistic approaches to sentiment analysis. And sentiment analysis is, some, is something that uh, I've been intrigued with quite a bit because I've done some corpus work on um, uh, health-related uh, corpora. And um, that, that, that's sort of an avenue that I would love to proceed. And so much else that's going on, Dr. Hayes Harb's own work, um, looking at uh, sound letter correspondences for, or non-correspondences for uh, second language learners plays into a tremendous interest I have in uh, relations between spoken and written language. So, so much great stuff going on in your department and uh, I, I feel it's a real privilege to be able to uh, spend this afternoon with you all. Uh, oh, Kim, did you wanna have a word here? Well, I get. Well, I want to say quickly how grateful I am, and even though, just like Rachel mentioned, I'm, you know, Dr. Rubin's the last student before his retirement, but I don't usually get this opportunity to present together. So this is a special privilege for me to have this opportunity to uh, present a study with Don. So thank you very much, everyone. Great. Um, So can everybody see the, the, the slides? Are they up so that you can see them? Great, let's see if I can figure out how to advance them. So <clears throat> I know uh, from my background in communication studies that nobody likes uncertainty, people like certainty. So we wanna give you an outline of, of what we plan to do. And uh, basically uh, I am like the wonder bread uh, on the outside of the two ends of the uh, front end and the back end of this presentation, Okim, is going to give you the substance. Uh, I would say she was going to give you the, the meaty part, but I, I know she's been a vegetarian for many years. So uh, she'll be the plant-based uh, substance part of this presentation. Um, uh, but I hope to be able to frame things a little bit for you. I'm going to move my, my camera just a second here. Hope, thing, hope to be able to frame things for you a little bit and maybe give the bigger picture and uh, and Okim has been doing such exciting work in the last few years, and we'll have the opportunity to hear about some of some of her recent work. Um, uh, we so we're going to uh, talk a little bit about accent and uh, how accent is one factor in the way both speakers and listeners construct their social identity. We think of social identity, which is something which is constructed in a process uh, rather than being a tattoo that you. Uh, live with and maybe it fades a little bit as you get older. Uh, and uh, we uh, will talk about uh, the research paradigm that Okim uh, has elaborated that we developed uh, for uh, looking at some of the ways in which uh, the way people have, the way listeners have constructed speaker social identities affect their capacity to perceive accent in uh, more or less accurate ways. Uh, Okim will uh, speak about um, the uh, uh, progress of recent studies that she's been running with her group at, at Northern Arizona. And finally, you know, I think it's important to, again, reframe the work that we've been doing uh, in a sense of uh, the world that, that, that we are part of. Um, one of the takeaways that uh, I hope will emerge for you, and, and if it doesn't, I'll make sure it does at the end, uh, 
is that uh, there's a, a tremendous value to this kind of programmatic research. I mean, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Hayes Harb kindly said, we've been working on this stuff since the late 80s. Uh, that's a while now. And we should have uh, learned something, and I think we have. But the, but the reason why we can feel confident in what we've learned is that we have been doing so much work on the same topic. And um, sometimes you choose a topic of interest to yourself, and sometimes the topic chooses you. Uh, in this case, I think uh, this work that we've been doing for the last 30 years has in some way chosen me. Um, but let, let's begin with sort of the very basics about what an accent is. <clears throat> Uh, and the, the conventional view is that it's a, a constellation of phonological and super segmental differences. And it wouldn't be an accent. It wouldn't be an accent if it didn't differ from something else. Um, so the idea that variability is built into every language system that we know of, and therefore every language system that we know of, uh, language variation becomes a key and crucial uh, topic to in, to explore and and to acknowledge uh, some of the other work that I don't I'm not sure if Okim will be addressing this at all later on but in some of the other work that we've done we've really tr tried to make an effort to look at um, super segmental uh, features of accents um, our our uh, general belief is that Super segmentals carry a tremendous weight, carry uh, or have huge salience in terms of the way listeners identify speakers and the judgments that they make about those speakers. Uh, we've been happy to collaborate with our colleague uh, Lucy Pickering on that subject and others. And uh, uh, th that is one uh, conclusion that we've reached that I think has tremendous importance for those of us who teach pronunciation. I've had uh, uh, spent a little bit of time teaching pronunciation uh, in, a, in a professional school, uh, actually a, a, a theological seminary. Uh, and um, uh, we found that the, the time that's devoted to working on uh, uh, super segmentals really has a much bigger impact uh, or at least a, a large impact than the time that we spend, that we devote to trying to accomplish some kind of um, phonological accuracy. So uh, that's, that's sort of uh, the, the, the sort of very common idea of what an accent is. <clears throat> but uh, I'd like to think about accent also in terms of functionality. Why do we have accents and, and, and why do accents work the way they do work? And again, my, our point is, my point is that accent is not merely a technical achievement, but rather it's very much an insignia of how you want to portray yourself to your listeners and to the various people that you interact with. And so uh, that motive, that those interaction, interactional goals um, vary from situation to situation. Sometimes you want to align yourself with people. Sometimes you want to distance yourself from people. Sometimes you want to uh, convey the sense that, um, you know, that you consider yourself a uh, higher status than some people that you are speaking with. And, and other times you want to express solidarity with those people. So the accent that we speak in, we all know about code switching and people vary their accent. Uh, and therefore it's important to think about uh, the, the, the degree of accentedness that anybody, any speaker brings into any particular kind of interaction. There are two papers that, you know, I'd like to commend to your attention. One is a very old paper by Bill LeBove called The Linguistic Consequences of Being Lame. It's not a paper that people read very much uh, anymore, if ever they did. And um, uh, what he does is he conducts a kind of a sociometric analysis of a, a, an adolescent uh, peer group, um, gang members and non and and sort of gang hangers on, and you can draw a sociogram of the relationships among these kids, uh, so that you can see who are the central actors, who are the key identifiers with this peer group, and who are sort of the more peripheral members of the peer group, and then he maps the features of black vernacular English onto. Uh, those actors, 
And lo and behold, there's a very clear patterning. Um, I think Dr. DeSantos has done some social networking research as well, if I'm not mistaken. But there's a very clear mapping of uh, accented or language features on the social centrality or the social peripheralness of those, of those kids. And uh, the Liebeck piece is also a paper that I, that I like very much. Um, and uh, in the Liebeck paper, she looks at some peculiar diphthongs. Uh, well, now I, I believe that um, uh, that, you, that we have some uh, Nordic linguists in, in this department as well. You look at some particular diphthongs of uh, Norwegian. And uh, the sample here are spouses of native speaking Norwegian, American spouses of native, native English speaking spouses of uh, Norwegians who've, their husbands have dragged them over to Norway to resettle. And uh, the question is how well are they going to accomplish accuracy in, in uh, assimilating this particular difficult diphthong, which it turns out is very salient to the Norwegians. That's how they know who is and who is not, you know, the real deal. Um, and lo and behold, it turns out that the people are happy to be in Norway. They love their in-laws, for example. They're really uh, happy to spend Thanksgiving with their in-laws. Uh, they have done a great job of assimilating that diphthong very, very quickly, whereas the people who remain reluctant and um, they, they, you know, they dream of cappuccinos in, in Brooklyn, uh, can't get over it. They never learn that diphthong. They never acquire it. Um, so those are two interesting studies, I think, that make the point how closely pronunciation and accent in general is linked to social identity. Um, and we're, I am also very much influenced by uh, a communication ad adaptation theory that was developed by Howie Giles and his colleagues. It's uh, just a way of talking about uh, how people often uh, unconsciously vary their speech style in order to uh, sometimes um, achieve solidarity and sometimes uh, to show, to build barriers and to create barriers between them and the people they're interacting with. You know, Giles' all, early work all related to rate of speech, rate of speech. And it turns out that you can very easily see that um, my rate of speech, that our rates of speech converge with each other. If I'm a fast speaker and you're a slower speaker, you, get, you speak a little bit faster, I speak a little slower. If we like each other and if we want to, uh, if we have positive aff affinity goals, and if we have um, disaffinity goals, if we want to show that we are not alike, our rates of speech diverge from each other. So even rate of speech, which is something we hardly ever think about consciously, uh, adapts depending on what our social goals are. So I call that the constructionist interactionist view of, in of accent. And our work is located within that, within that view. Uh, so that uh, we know that uh, listeners always do want to identify their uh, interlocutors. Uh, they want to find, they want to know who this person is. We all want to know who, who is this that we're talking to. And if we don't know exactly who they are, we make it up, right? We, we fantasize, we imagine who this person is that we're speaking to based on very flimsy evidence. Our colleague, um, uh, Lindemann, uh, has uh, done some nice work showing that if you play people a speech sample, their guesses about what the national identity of this person is are all over the place, but everybody is pretty confident that they know who this person is. So we're going to play that game right here if my sound is working. Let me play you a very short sample, and then you can maybe unmute yourself and say who you think, what do you think the identity of this person is? What Not only the uh, ethnic and or national identity, but what else are you imagining about, what else are you visualizing about this person? How vivid is your sense of who this person is? Guys, this is teacher Daniel again uh, with one more class. I'm sorry about the noise. I'm here at the uh, Della driving schools. I'm waiting for my driver. He's been in the room for like two hours. Uh, but anyways, just want to give you a quick class on uh, American accent. So, you want me to play it one more time? You can listen to it again. Let's play it. It's pretty short. Guys, this is Teacher Daniel again. 
uh, with one more class. I'm sorry about the noise. I'm here at the uh, Della driving schools. I'm waiting for my driver. He's been in the room for like two hours. Uh, but anyways, just want to give you a quick class on uh, American acts. Okay, anybody brave enough to hazard a guess what you think this person's native language, well, and I'll give it away. He's not a native speaker of English. Anybody want to hazard a guess about where you think this person uh, originated his, his uh, nation of, of origin? Yeah, I've, if I had enough time, I would have created a, uh, a poll so we could poll you. Um, well, let's see, there's somebody in the chat room, is there? Let's see. Uh, somewhere in Europe, okay, that's, thank you for playing with me. Anybody else want to put something in the chat room, in the chat? Spanish? Any other guesses? Very patient. Native Spanish or Italian, okay, Romance language speaker, we have a lot of, uh, we have, well, we have some uh, inclination to uh, think of this person as a Romance language speaker or a Norwegian. Um, you know, it hardly matters. I, I will tell you what his actual origin is, but it hardly matters. Turns out he is um, a, a Saudi, uh, native Saudi speaker. Um, maybe you could hear that in, um, I, you know, the L, Dalla, Dalla. He's waiting at Dalla. Um, were you influenced just by the uh, phonology or was, was there anything else that you can point to that maybe influenced your guess, your, your imagining of who this speaker might have been? Was, was anybody curious about the content of what he was speaking about? That What is this business about waiting for a driver and then the driver's has been in a room for two hours. That's kind of curious content. Did that pique your, pique your interest and give you a particular image of what this person might have been like? He has a driver, really? Well, uh, it's hard in this environment to, uh, uh, to get a lot of interactivity out of you, although we hope to get some, here, let's see, we get some interactivity out of you later. Yeah, so somebody was confused about uh, the driving thing, but uh, I guess knows enough Arabic to know that Abdullah is a coffee pitcher. Um, so yeah, so there were some, some cues there. In my experience, we seize on those little cues and we use those to construct an identity for who this person might be. And that's kind of what li reverse linguistic uh, stereotyping is all about. Guys, this So the paradigm that we have developed uh, is the is uh, oh, I'm sorry the traditional linguistic stereotyping uh, paradigm this is out of place is that we hear brief samples of a speech we we have some uh, stereotype of uh, who speaks that kind of language and then we uh, at, attribute to the individual speaker our stereotypes of the people from that nationality um, and uh, if you know that literature which originated in uh, in the late 60s mid 60s in uh, French Canada, uh, much of it was originally based on uh, stereotypes of Anglophone versus Francophone speakers in Quebec. Um, people draw all kinds of uh, stereotypes uh, based on speech samples. Um, the ones that are particularly consequential from a social point of view have to do with academic ability or we're concerned that somebody hears a speaker and hears their accent, makes some kind of stereotype judgment about what this person's academic ability is. And then, you know, in education, we have this phenomenon we call the Pygmalion effect, where it turns out that a teacher's expectation or self-fulfilling prophecy, turns out that a teacher's expectation of a student uh, is often, um, uh, uh, often comes to fruition, comes to reality. So if I expect a student to be a so-called late bloomer, uh, this person's going to start reading in the next few months. Lo and behold, the person starts reading. And we know in K-12 classrooms how that actually, the process by which that actually becomes instantiated, the teacher makes more eye contact, the teacher calls on that student more often, 
often very much uh, without self-consciousness. Uh, so if you link a stereotype to academic ability, particularly in K-12 education, that has tremendous consequences for uh, the likelihood that the student will or will not uh, excel. And then we have a tremendous literature that I hope you're all familiar with about the real world implications for adults and how uh, the way the accent that one speaks with and the stereotypes that those engender affect uh, whether or not um, you will be considered uh, as a viable renter for an apartment. Uh, John Baugh, a colleague at uh, Washington University of St. Louis, has done a great job of of producing videos and all kinds of stuff. And the uh, uh, U.S. Housing Authority as well has uh, demonstration tapes that show how uh, people. Uh, are either accepted or rejected as uh, renters by landlords, depending on their accent and uh, many, many other real world implications. So uh, in my own graduate education, <clears throat> we did a lot of work in, in that linguistic stereotyping paradigm. And we were interested, particularly in, in, in the you know, mid seventies, we were interested in knowing how the um, lack of educational progress that many uh, African-American students in the United States made relative to uh, what their potential, their capacity was, how can we, how can linguistic stereotyping be a part explanation for why these students are not excelling in, particularly in their K-12 education uh, environments. So we did some studies where we had good essays and bad essays and we had speakers of black English vernacular and speakers of standard American English and we indeed found that uh, teachers would um, give lower grades to, on the very same composition, give lower grades to kids who spoke black English vernacular and then they read the composition. The composition was associated with the speech of a standard English speaker and all of a sudden what had been a C essay becomes a, an A minus essay. And that was dramatic and unfortunately not surprising. But we had one study where what we decided to do was to intrude errors into the students' essays. We intruded errors that were associated with uh, errors that, I'm putting those in quote marks, that are associated with Black English vernacular in some essays and not in others. And uh, we wanted to see whether the teachers, these are K-12 teachers, would be able to identify whether uh, the students, uh, first of all, uh, were speakers of Black English vernacular based on their writing samples. Um, and then what, what, what that would do to their uh, evaluation of the students' written compositions. And uh, this, for me, this was like a, a watershed mark in my own uh, development. Uh, we got the data back and we found out that even though we knew some of these essays had lots of so-called errors and others did not, the teachers were not very good at discerning those errors. And you know, in second language, acquisition, second, uh, English as a uh, world language, it's a huge literature on error detection, error gravity. It's worth taking a look at that literature. Um, but it turns out that uh, these teachers were not very good at identifying the errors and there was no, you know, uh, we have a manipulation check uh, that, uh, we use, that we always use when we do this research to see were they able to detect the errors or weren't they? And they were not. So I remember my advisor, fellow Jean Pichet uh, said, well, I guess this, this is a direct quote. I guess we have to flush this one down the toilet. And my, my fellow students and I had worked so hard on this project, we could not flush it down the toilet. So we went back and looked at the data more carefully. And we saw that <clears throat> when the teachers had identified a student as being African American, all of a sudden they were detecting lots of errors, whether, and they were giving the students a lower grade. When the teachers thought that this thing was written, for whatever reason, they thought it was written by a, the essay was written by uh, a speaker of standard English or by a white child, um, they, gave, they did not detect as many errors and they gave it a higher grade. And that's what, we, so we wrote an article about that. And uh, to me, that was, uh, you know, a great epiphany because what's going on here was, the reality of what was in the essays. We knew what was in the essays because we put them in there. We put the errors in there. But the reality of what was in the essays was not as important as uh, what was in the 
uh, imaginations of the receivers of this language. And so uh, we began to understand that people saw the language in ways that conformed with their expectations rather than looking more objectively at the language and having their expectations for the students in this case influenced by uh, uh, what they saw. And that uh, <clears throat> at some morphed and evolved into what we're now calling the reverse linguistic stereotyping paradigm, which is to say that by some form or some means, a social identity is described to a speaker. Maybe I tell you, hey, listen to this speech sample of the Saudi guy. He's a, he's a riot. Once you hear his speech, you know, you can't believe what he's going to do to his L's, you know. Um, maybe I tell you what the social identity is, or maybe uh, you look at somebody's physical appearance like a photograph. And that tells you what the social identity is. But once the social identity is ascribed, that evokes some kind of expectation from most listeners. And we, none of us are exempt from this, none of us. No matter how sophisticated we are in phonological analysis, none of us are exempt from this. Um, it evokes a linguistic expectation. And, and then we evaluate the language performance. We evaluate the kid's essay, or we evaluate speech proficiency based on what we think we're hearing not necessarily on what's in the symbol, uh, in the speech signal. So here's the research paradigm. I'm going to stop real quick. Uh, the research paradigm and, and uh, the studies that um, Okim will talk about will riff off, of, improvise off of this basic uh, paradigm in some shape or another. So we have two photographs. Uh, it's important to equate the photographs with physical attractiveness because sad to say, the, the most potent variable in all of this research is physical attractiveness. We really, really like people who are good looking and we think they're smart and we want them to be our friends. Uh, un, unfortunate for, uh, for people uh, like me. But um, uh, it's important to equate the, not only equate the, the photos in terms of physical attractiveness, but also we then independently measure physical attractiveness and we use that as a covariate so that we can uh, you know, control for the variance that's a, that is due to individual perceptions of physical attractiveness. And then, uh, like the French, uh, sort of in a takeoff on what the French Canadians did in the classic kind of reverse stereotyping, uh, reverse linguistic stereotyping study, you listen to one speech sample and it's often a standard English speech sample. So you've seen a photograph, in one case it looks like a, an Anglo person, in another case it looks like an Asian person, uh, East Asian person. Uh, then you listen to one speech sample, and then you ask people, uh, you know, uh, did you understand what this person said? Uh, in fact, you can give them a comprehension test in some of our studies. Um, what do you think about this guy? Do you think he's tall? Do you think he's socially attractive? Do you think he's enthusiastic? Um, and what is his speaking proficiency? And then I also asked some questions about your background. How much exposure have you had to, to non-native speakers, for example? So that's the basic paradigm. And, and uh, you'll, you'll see uh, in the work that Okim does, it gets repeated over and over again. Uh, some of our earlier findings is that, are that um, reverse linguistic stereotyping can account for a 15% up to a 15% decline in comprehension scores. Now that finding has not been replicated in every one of our studies. I wish it had been, but it hasn't been. So we need to do a little bit better job of teasing out when, when does this reverse linguistic stereotyping effect impact comprehension, when does it not? Um, in terms of uh, speech evaluation scores, we know that stuff that's not relevant to what's in the speech stream. So both your uh, reversing your inclination to reverse, to engage in reverse linguistic stereotyping and also background variables that uh, those can account for 20% of the variance in your ratings of speakers. Um, so whatever is, whatever is the true variance, I mean, if you've ever taken a course in measurement and, and validity analysis, you know that psychometricians talk about true variance, which is how much of the variance in these scores really speaks to, really reflects the trait that you say you're measuring. In this case, you say you're measuring speech proficiency. So how much of the variance in your ratings really reflects differences in the speaking, in the speech proficiency of these speakers? Well, we know it's less than 80% because 
because we've got all this other irre trait irrelevant variants going on, including reverse linguistic stereotyping. It's probably much less than 80% because there's other things we're not measuring here uh, recently. Uh, Okim and I, maybe it's not so recent anymore, published an article on intra rater reliability, intra rater reliability, and it, that's certainly a source of trait irrelevant variance when we rate uh, speech proficiency. It's, it's a big factor. Uh, you know, whether you're tired or you're energized or you're bored or you're interested or your stomach, tummy is rumbling or you're dreading having to go, sit through a symposium, at, a linguistic symposium later in the day, all of those, you know, uh, contextual factors impact your ratings of speaking proficiency. The same exact speaker. That's not good. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to move on because uh, really we need to get to the uh, um, plant-based protein part of this talk. Uh, but, uh, and I think Okim will elaborate uh, on some of these findings that we've had about some of the background factors that, uh, that do seem to impact people's ability to hear a speech sample more or less, you know, uh, more or less uh, accurately, right? at least to have some consensus with experts who have rated those same speech samples. Um, one of the more promising things that Okim in particular has have done is uh, asked, can we train people to become more accurate evaluators? And the good news is yes, we can. Um, so uh, I think we're up to Okim now. You have to unmute yourself though. And I will stop sharing, I think. Okay. Oh, Kim, don't forget to un unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? I was so engaged in Don's talk and I thought I was a listener, not a presenter, but I am a presenter. So I'll move on. Um, like Don mentioned in the outline, I will be sharing those four studies. Uh, these are the studies that I've done with my former students. Um, I believe findings of these stu studies do provide some evidence on uh, listener stereotypes and their expectations on this accented perceptual judgment. The first study, let me close that. First study is about the non-native students' expectations and the reverse linguistic stereotyping. Um, I assume through Don's talk and uh, other undergrad symposium research, this concept of reverse linguistic stereotyping is not that new anymore, at least today. What I thought about though, uh, the, the motivation of this study is most of these studies were usually done with American listeners, American listeners as a native speakers, usually undergrad students. Then later I realized including myself as a non-native speaker, maybe our English learners, non-native speakers could still have these issues of uh, linguistic stereotyping or reverse linguistic stereotyping. So what we looked at is, do ESL students show any tendencies toward this reverse linguistic stereotyping when they uh, have to listen to any kind of listening materials uh, delivered by a non-native English teacher? And the issue of teachers, non-native teachers, this is another topic uh, in the field of applied linguistics. The methodology-wise, this is very similar. The similar design to the one, uh, Kang Rubin 2009, uh, matched guide technique. Here, we used 39 ESL students as listeners. Those are all uh, students at our intensive English program. We prepared a grammar, English grammar lecture. Uh, something about English conditionals. And these speech files were recorded by an advanced Korean learner of English. She's, you will listen to her speech a little later after this slide. She's very, very intelligible. Um, and after these ESL students listened to that lecture, that lesson, they had to take a comprehension test. This is more like a grammar test with the 10 questions, multiple choice questions along with the short answers. The picture here you see is one of the 
distractor picture. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Kang Rubin 2009, you have two pictures for your primary studies and there's a distractor picture that's going to be uh, included in between. So this person we showed on the screen with a Chinese okay, accent. Okay, I'm not seeing, are, are others seeing it? Do you not see the, the, oh, the you're picture okay. in the middle? That's my bad. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. And do you see this screen? Yeah. And these two pictures are the actual uh, ones used for the study. So the picture on the left is a native speaker, as you can see, and picture on the right is the actual person who provided the sound file, and she's a Korean um, original. And we play the sound files something like this. English has different ways of expressing real, which is factual, and unreal, which is hypothetical. Okay, so one time all these ESL students had to listen to this lecture with the picture projected on the screen on the left. And the second time, the similar design, but they had to listen to this one. In English grammar, we use different ways of expressing possible and impossible situations in the past and present. These lectures are about two, three minutes long. And we randomized it. So one time they heard the second lecture with the uh, first picture. Next time, you know, the second, uh, first lecture with the uh, second uh, picture. So we totally randomized this whole design. But just like Gang Rubin 2009 studies, findings were very similar. In fact, these English uh, students, their grammar test scores were significantly higher when they lis listen to the lecture with the Caucasian face on the screen. Basically, they retained more information when they thought they were being taught by a Caucasian English teacher. And we also asked them after, you know, did anyone think they might have heard the lecture with the same voice by the same speaker? Nobody, nobody said they actually heard the lecture two times. So this is pretty much the same design um, and pretty much it confirms that this stereotyping issue is everywhere for everybody, not just US undergrad students. The second study is about the impact of linguistic stereotyping and reverse linguistic stereotyping on the perceptions of grammaticality. In this case, um, after we, you know, today we heard about this paradigm of linguistic stereotyping and reverse linguistic stereotyping. Both of them are looking at the stereotyping issues. But as a researcher, after being trained by Don, I later got to be interested in finding out which has more influence on listeners' perception between the uh, linguistic stereotyping or reverse linguistic stereotyping. So this study is pretty much to find out the linguistic or non-linguistic cues affect the way listeners write speech performances. Uh, I conducted two experiments, but before I move on to the study in details, I wanna introduce this study. Many of you might be familiar with this one. This is actually a fascinating one, in fact, Don forwarded this study that year uh, after I think he read it and he thought this is a fascinating one and I was really, really impressed. Basically, the study is about accent and credibility. According to the findings of this study, accented speech is less believable than non-accented speech. So if you look at a sentence like this, there are approximately 20,000 feathers on an eagle or a mosquito has two teeth. You know, these trivia sentences, like statements, we really don't know whether this is true or false. But if listeners are heard, you know, they got to hear these statements with a standard American accent, then they say, oh, this might be true, or maybe close to truth. Or they say, at least, I don't know. But if they hear these statements with accented speech, then they say, oh, that's false. Pretty much that's the idea. Therefore, for my study, I wanted to know if American listeners, they hear the same sentences, like English sentences, but with an accented speech or 
like standard American accent? Do they find the sentences grammatical or ungrammatical? So the first experiment, this is for the reverse linguistic stereotyping. Uh, just like the one before, Kang Rubin, or the one uh, I just introduced, we prepared the two picture guides uh, and we played one, I mean, the native speakers of sound files. Two speakers, this case, we prepared two different recordings from native speakers. Um, both of them are from uh, California. We used 94 undergrad students as listeners. And these listeners were asked to identify whether the sentence was grammatically correct or incorrect once they listened to these. And we prepared a total uh, 40 sentences, 20 grammatical sentences and 20 ungrammatical sentences. And those ungrammatical sentences by definition are the ones they seem grammatical on the surface level, but they have some major syntactic errors. So we went through these 40 sentences one by one to make sure those are uh, uh, in that line. So here, pretty much for the speech files, we used faces on the right as a guide and faces on the left, they provided sound files. So as you can see, those are both native speakers and uh, following the mixed uh, matched guide technique. So we will be listening to some of it just to have an idea. So we told the listeners, the men on the screen would like to teach English in a local university and the mock uh, grammar lesson, this is what he is going to say. And then they listen and they have to decide whether this is grammatical and ungrammatical. So here. The men expect each other to have left. But you know, a sentence is like this. One time they may uh, hear on uh, with a picture uh, projected on the screen on the left, and another one. I don't think I've ever seen you eat asparagus. And the second time they have to see the picture on the screen with the face on the right, and they have to decide the grammar, uh, whether it's grammatical and ungrammatical. And as you can see from these findings again and again, there was a significant difference in terms of their decision on the grammaticality. Uh, so most participants stated that the Indian guys produced fewer grammatically correct sentences, pretty much more ungrammatical sentences versus when they saw, when they listened to the sentences with the Caucasian face projected. And there was a significant difference. So it's like it's the same findings again and again. So after this study, we used the same listeners, but this time we dropped the whole pictures. We only play the sound files, but different sentences. We prepared additional 40 sentences. Uh, and for this one, we didn't say anything about the speakers. We just presented these 40 sentences. And of course, 20 sentences were accented and the other 20 sentences were um, pretty much the standard accent. We will listen to some of it. Actually, these two faces, they are the one who provided the recordings. So this Indian guy recorded the sentences and vice versa. And the question is whether accented speech makes the sentence less grammatical or more grammatical. Uh, let's just play out and see how we do with this study. I think that it is reluctant that Jean will dance. I'm going to play one more time. I think that it is reluctant that Jean will dance. Would that be grammatical or ungrammatical? This is ungrammatical. Okay. He studied biology and learned how to categorize and draw animals accurately. Grammatical, very good. Every assignment to do was easy, but every paper to was hard. Ungrammatical. Louis hinted Mary stole the post last night. I'm gonna play one more time. Louis hinted Mary stole the post last night. That's actually grammatical. But in fact, you know, I don't know how everyone performed. Like Don said, it's hard to see 
with this virtual uh, mode, there's no interaction. So this is difficult to see how we are uh, doing. But when listeners listen to the sound files without the picture, a lot of cases, they were quite accurate. So here, well, there was slight, like look at this, uh, the mean uh, for the non-native speaker 5.37 or for the native speaker 5.45. There's a slight difference with the native speaker slightly higher, but there's no significant difference. When listeners didn't look at the picture, but just listen to the sound files, there was no significant difference for their judgment. But as we saw earlier, when they looked at the picture with the guys and decided to do that evaluation, there was a significant difference on their judgment. So at least based on this study, what we found out is reverse linguistic stereotyping is a lot more impactful, like stronger than the linguistic stereotyping. Well, again, whether this paralinguistic features has a more significant influence than the linguistic ones, we don't know. I mean, more research needs to be done to validate uh, this finding, but this is where we are. And the next study is about the context. So here, what we wanted to find out is how our judgment changes based on the context. To what extent? especially the academic or occupational context can affect listeners' judgments of accented speech. So here, um, for this one, we just used undergrad students. Uh, again, it's not a real life context, but still we used the 64 undergrad students. Most, they are all here at University of Arizona, at the Northern Arizona University. And they had to do some speech ratings uh, for the comprehensibility and accentedness and acceptabilities and different measures. For this study, we prepared three speakers, Spanish accented English, Chinese accented English, and Arabic accented. They all male speakers. We also used one distractor, uh, standard accent, American. We also used three male international teaching assistants. So there were six uh, there were three speakers and also four distractors. So here we prepared different academic lectures and also different, more like a semi-structured um, conversations in a re more like occupational context. So first academic lectures, one lecture is about humanity. Another one is about social science, especially medical anthropology. The, uh, another lecture is about physical science. The distractor provided a lecture. They all 30 seconds once again about Einstein theory. Uh, the rest of 30 second files were about semi-scripted um, interaction. One is about restaurant manager. The other one is um, especially elementary school teacher, K to 12 teacher context. This is about the interaction where teacher is having a parent conference meeting and listeners are asked to be one of the uh, student's parent and the doctor physician uh, context. And also there was a distractor about the lawyer's situation. So here, in this case, before they start their speech evaluation, we gave them this particular context. So, Something like this. The following recording features is a humanity professor giving a lecture about the sports and daily life. The professor has 10 years of professional experience. So every context, we emphasize that the speaker has a very professional experience background. They are not like a random person just giving a lecture. Uh, in the history, uh, then you are a student in the class, please make a judgment on the following lectures based on this context. So after they listen to a lecture like this, they have to decide whether the professor is acceptable, accented, easy to understand, etc. Let's listen. One of the keys to the collapse of the Roman democracy is quite plainly that people were distinctly unhappy with it. Um, this leads to the rise of individuals of enormous power. 
all these speakers were actually either full-time instructors or our PhD students. So they are already teaching and have a lot of teaching experience. And this is uh, one example for the occupational context. This is a doctor situation. Following recording features a doctor sharing the test results. And doctor in the recording has 10 years of professional experience, the same deal. Uh, then you are a patient. So how is your rate? And this is an example. So I just got the results uh, back from the lab. The test shows uh, a mild infection. Uh, nothing to worry about. It's not that serious. It could be easily treated with antibiotics. So this one has an Arabic accent. Anyway, so like uh, the, keep in mind that each speaker had to record six different sound files. And it took a long time, but everyone listened to the, at least six times of the same speakers. And um, pretty much the design is here. Uh, all six speakers, three different uh, academic contexts, three different uh, occupational contexts. We have a one native speaker uh, providing two sound files, and we also have a three ITAs. So they had to listen to 23 sound files. And we randomized it. So oftentimes the listeners didn't know they heard the same speakers again and again. We had these uh, speech rating uh, constructs. I'm going to present mostly the comprehensibility and acceptability. But uh, important thing is high number means good score, easy to understand, or definitely uh, acceptable. Low number means just negative, bad, like uh, difficult to understand or not acceptable. So this is the first finding. Here I'm presenting only for the comprehensibility. Again, this is just for the analysis of the same speakers for the six different contexts. And this is the results for the repeated measure ANOVA. And if you can see just first the three versus the, the next three, there's a significant difference between these two different contexts. So listeners, these undergrad students found professors, um, I mean, the professional context, speakers in the professional context, easier to understand or much more comprehensible. So like the same speakers, let's say you hear the same accent in a doctor uh, situations or restaurants or in a, in a school uh, context, then they find that speech a lot more comprehensible than the one in the lecture. But if you look at the next one, just looking at this academic context, they find the humanity lectures much more comprehensible than the physical science lecture. But one thing that I had got to realize after the study was completed was that my listeners were mostly in the humanities, like a College of Arts and Letters and College of Education. And some of them are from uh, the science fields, but not many. So I assume, regardless of the accent, maybe they found the physics lecture difficult to understand. So that's possibly the limitation of this study. But the next one here, what's interesting is listeners found the doctor's speech especially more comprehensible and easy to understand than the waiters. And this represents the status associated with the job, assuming that the doctor's speech has more authority and making more sense. And actually quite a few listeners on the grad students did say they actually got to hear that accent in the real situation. Like one of the doctors they had to visit, doctor's office had the same accent and didn't have a problem with it. Like all I cared is like a doctor giving me the right medicine so that I felt better. <laughs> So there wasn't a problem for them. What is really interesting was this finding when it comes to acceptability. So in this case, here, by the way, there was no difference between the accentiness rating between the waiters and the teacher. The accentiness wise, there's hardly no difference, but the, there was a significant difference between this waiter and the teacher uh, uh, context for the acceptability. In other words, we told the listeners that the accent they got to hear 
would be the teacher of their future children. And these listeners were asked to have a parent conference with that teacher. And how would you feel? Then these students said, no, I would not want that teacher with accent to be my son's or my daughter's teacher because I would not my daughter and son to have that accent. Even our undergrad students said that. That's actually pretty um, sad <laughs> to hear, but uh, it was pretty clear. Like I wouldn't mind like myself as a parent having been exposed to that accent, but if my children had that opportunity, I wouldn't feel comfortable. So that was uh, pretty much the arrangement. I guess the implication of this study is mostly the relationship between the stereotyping issues and context. I think sometimes we do speech evaluation just for the non-native speakers, uh, ignoring the actual context, but it looks like the context uh, can make a big difference. Okay, this is the last study. Actually, the study was motivated by just the, the, the former study uh, that I um, got to present at AAAL two, a couple of years ago. And, you know, I did the whole study findings about the context, the importance of the context, but one of the participants, the one person from the audience uh, raised the hand and said, why are your studies are always done in an academic context using university students? What's the point of doing this study and talking about the importance of stereotyping and not really handling the real life situation? So I was really inspired by that <laughs> comment. Uh, and thought, wow, that's right, the, the real importance is in the real life context. So what we tried here is to find out the effect of uh, the foreign accent on the prospects of employment in the US, especially American restaurants in the Southwest region, which is basically Flagstaff. We did the study in the Flagstaff uh, place. Uh, for your information, this, it took two years for me to get the ILB approval. So the study was done, well, the, almost a year and a half ago, and uh, ILB people were not happy about this research. So it took a long time. It just got approved like a couple of months ago. So I'm glad that I am able to share this uh, with the Utah uh, colleagues and students. So uh, the methodology. This one, uh, I did a study with one of my former graduate students who's a North African female immigrant. She came to the US uh, with a family when she was five years old. And I don't know whether you can see this. So like a note. Well, this is not her, by the way. The picture on the screen, I could not use her face, but roughly like her, uh, to give you an idea. Um, and of course, because she came here when she was five, she spoke perfect English, just like another native speaker. You know, you could never tell whether she had an accent. But she acted as a waitress job applicant. And we initially started to contact 17 restaurants. Like, it, <laughs> we didn't tell anyone that we were doing research. So we just made a phone call and said, you know, um, my student, you know, I'm looking for a job. You know, I'm wondering, you know, whether you can have, uh, whether I can have an interview and et cetera, et cetera. We ended up with a 12 upscale um, American restaurant managers and owners to see if they could hire this North African looking American immigrant. Uh, with the six restaurants, using this matched guide idea, she presented herself as an immigrant with a very strong North African accent, but very intelligible, you know, um, highly intelligible. And with the six restaurants, she showed up as an American with a standard American accent. And of course, we didn't tell the restaurants anything about the research, anything about her background. That's why ILB didn't like it. So we could not really for, uh, move forward with this at the very beginning. And um, pretty much, you know, the, each restaurant managers gave her the list of questions and, you know, we did the practice before she went. So she did a fantastic job, really. 
But the finding was something shocking, we thought. So with the very first, the six response, when she had an interview with that second language accent, um, I mean, finding wasn't that terribly surprising. She was immediately turned down, actually, by many of the employers saying, well, your English is not good enough. And when we say upscale restaurant, we pretty much chose the most expensive ones here in Flagstaff. I mean, Flagstaff is relatively small, so we don't have that many options. So we chose like the best ones only. Um, but pretty much the reason was her English wasn't good enough. So we understood. But what is shocking was the second one. The second one, actually four out of six restaurant managers said they would be reluctant to hire that student regardless of her accent. Um, pretty much by saying her appearance is not American enough. And this is the exact quote. It's like a direct quote that I uh, am sharing here. So the employer's uh, responses included that the features of the candidate's appearance did not resemble. They said a typical look of a waitress at an American upscale restaurant. And we asked, I mean, not we, like I told her to ask. So she asked, um, a typical American would be the someone who mostly looked like a Caucasian white in terms of physical features, who could have sometimes include immigrants from Europe or some other parts of the world, but pretty much that means some European countries. And one employer said, I can control my own bias and treat all of my staff equally, but I have noticed a clear relationship between some customers' hostil uh, um, hostility towards the waiting staff and their foreign look. I tend to try and avoid these conflicts altogether by hiring waiting staff that is more likely to appeal to my customers. And this might sound unfair, but the world isn't. So he says, like, deal with it. Like, I can't do anything about it. And that's what the reality is. And uh, the world aren't usually nice in our, I mean, people are not usually nice in our business. So mm, my student went back and kept saying, well, I don't understand why you made this decision. And they were pretty upset and saying, this is what it is. Just go with it. So, I mean, we, we left pretty much. So, um, actually, after we got these findings, I was very emotionally um, disturbed as a non-native speaker myself. And um, I'm sure this is a good uh, case in point that in this world, uh, these conflicts are uh, everywhere, I think. And uh, unfortunately, even though, you know, uh, thanks to Don, I mean, I was able to open up my eyes to this field and trying to do more research and try to share things um, with the field. But I think things are not changing <laughs> that easily. Um, and I'm sure Don's going to talk about the solutions to these problems, which is also very important. Um, but pretty much my Conclusion is um, the stereotyping issues and expectations is everywhere. <laughs> uh, hopefully, uh, we could be aware of this the importance of these issues and try to make an effort to uh, make a better world. And uh, thank you, everyone. And I'm gonna just stop sharing and give this. Uh, uh, Screen to Don. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but <clears throat> um, I have a few reactions. One is how incredibly uh, proud I am of the work that Okim is doing and uh, how impressive her persistence in teasing out different elements of, of the issues that we're dealing with, how, how impressed I am by that. And it speaks to what I mentioned at the beginning as one of the takeaways I hope you will receive is that 
any any truth that we want to find out about is multifaceted and has so many different uh, components to it. You have to keep chipping away at and chipping away at it, and that I think is exactly what we're seeing Okim do, and um, she's doing a you know fantastic job of it. Uh, the second reaction that I personally have, of course, is that uh, it's quite depressing. I know, Don. I <laughs> cried, actually. I was so mad. And I almost wanted to call these managers, but I couldn't, you know? Yeah. But I don't know. I live in a city like this. Can you imagine Flagstaff? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, so we, we can talk in the abstract about structural racism and xenophobia and here i think we have very concrete uh uh a way of looking at it very concretely um is my uh my powerpoint showing right now are we we are we here can, can you see the powerpoint uh, not yet you can we cannot yet cannot see it okay okay so i'm gonna thrash around a little bit and see if why if i can make it happen <clears throat> oh because i have to there we go now you can see it i hope yes we can great okay um so i'm going to actually skip through we can talk have a conversation ourselves if we want to uh talk more about uh some of the future directions for this research but i do uh maybe be before we end before we begin our before we end the formal presentation and we begin our more dialogic i hope conversation with each other i do want to um uh hopefully end on a, or conclude on a more positive note or a hopeful note there's a lot of work to be done one of the areas that clearly requires uh all of us in language studies to direct some attention is how do we reduce how do we how do we have some impact on uh the reverse linguistic stereotyping that we know is so prevalent among listeners and as okim uh i think hinted at least uh it's not only in the united states but but, but probably all over the world in many of the language contexts that you are familiar with uh so for example we spend a lot of time, those of us who have some involvement in uh, teaching English as a foreign language or as a second language, uh, we spend a lot of time working on uh, various aspects of um, language profici proficiency for our students. Uh, what, maybe it's a mistake to be teaching them in isolation from uh, from native speakers. And so we have in this department, I think, also work that goes on on double immersion, uh, double immersion uh, uh, ESL uh, classes in the public schools. I'd like to know, I'd like someone to, to let us know whether double immersion instruction is one of the keys to reduce this kind of stereotyping. Um, uh, you know, should we be training native speakers and non-native speakers together? Um, but where I really wanna go because time is short is, uh, to talk about, uh, and you know, one of the uh, again a little bit depressing finding maybe is that uh, as we've seen from the, some of the research that Okim has presented, uh, many times people are impervious even to very intelligible language skills, and they still perceive them so uh, perceive them as unintelligible. So. Um, uh, how do how do we uh, push people over the threshold of foreignness so that people can look, for example, at a North African person who is essentially a native speaker, been in the United States since the age of five, and recognize that this person, in fact, speaks with a uh, a standard English variety? Um, there's some some reason to believe that that. Uh, 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 any kind of uh, deficiency in, you know, I certainly have speaking proficiency deficiencies. You're hearing them right now. Um, and uh, lack of fluency and, and mispronounced words and omissions and elisions and all kinds of things. Um, there's some evidence that Okim gets dinged 
for her lack of proficiency, for whatever deficiencies she may have in her, in her speech proficiency, more than I get dinged for my lack of uh, uh, proficiency. Um, there's some, some empirical evidence that that's the fact. So uh, in general, we believe that our body of research challenges the reliability and validity of high stakes assessments for non-native speakers. And that includes uh, in particular um, uh, citizenship testing that involves language proficiency. And in the United States, citizenship testing does include some kind of spoken interview. Um, how can we be, you know, when you hear the body of research that Okim just described, how can you begin to even suspect that there could be anything valid to uh, an oral interview that uh, prospective citizens are, are put through in order to achieve citizenship in the United States? Um, so there are policy issues, policy issues that uh, follow from the work that's being done here. So I want to conclude with this uh, enjoyment to all of you, everybody here that's that's stuck with us this long, and and uh, you know I congratulate you on your your perseverance for sticking with us this long. Let's all vow to make sure that the research that we do makes a difference, and I I think there are lots of ways to make sure that our research makes a difference. I happen to be somebody who thinks that a, a person who studies, say, medieval art history makes a difference in this world. That's an important topic for somebody to study because it helps us understand concepts of beauty and representation and it makes our world a world that's worth living in. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not uh, uh, trying to come across as a person who is a, you know, hard policy advocate kind of guy, but whatever topic of study you choose, or as I said at the beginning, whatever topic of study chooses you, Let's think about how does it make a difference in our world? So uh, here are some conclusions that, I, that we've reached. One is that when you do your research, look, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Hayes Harb at the beginning said that we had sophisticated research methods. Actually, that's not true. We have the simplest research method in the world. Two pictures, one voice. How much simpler can a research paradigm be than that? And in fact, I think that that's what's given this research some legs. People can look at the research that we do and they say, oh, I get it. I see how that worked. Um, and so, you know, contrary to, uh, you know, colleagues that I respect very much, um, I really think that the simpler we can keep our research methods, the more likely it is to have an impact on, on real people, real stakeholders, real policymakers. Um, we need to help decision makers realize that any judgment of speech proficiency is rife with bias and uh, that whatever tools we have in our toolbox to help reduce bias, we need to take those tools out and keep them sharp and, and use them all the time. I'll, uh, let's see how I can, see. well, recently there was a uh, executive order. I would, it had an impact on me you're probably not from aware of it, but an executive order issuing from our president indicating that we should, uh, that, the, that the federal government will no longer support anti-bias training uh, and stereotyping training. Uh, well, we believe we have hard evidence that shows that it's necessary to make deliberate efforts to engage in anti-bias training for all of us. Um, in our work, we want to make sure that uh, when we talk about comprehension, we want to be able to understand each other, that this is not just training which is necessary for speakers to have, but it's training which every listener, native speaker, non-native speaker, we need to train the listeners to be able to hear what's in the speech stream and not what they think is in the speech stream. Uh, the good news is we think we have some tools to do that. Okim uh, alluded to some studies we've done uh, that, that use some, you know, uh, pretty traditional uh, anti-prejudice training principles um, that we don't know whether the impact of those training materials, what, what, the, what the duration of the impact is. We only know we have immediate post-test findings that are encouraging. We need somebody to do uh, extended, uh, delayed post-test findings. Um, and then finally, I guess the last word I want to leave you with is that uh, 
we have, those of us who are in language study, one way or another, whether we are celebrating the amazing achievement that language is for even the least of us, the least of us achieves this amazing accomplishment of, of acquiring language. Um, or whether we are looking at the astounding systematicity of, of the language that we do acquire, or whether we are working, you know, directly to uh, um, try to uh, reduce inequities in people's access to language instruction and to, the, and to the goods and services that language provides for all of us, all of us need to realize that at the heart of the work that we do in language study is preservation, uh, uh, is the core of our work is the impulse to preserve social justice and to celebrate, celebrate uh, the um, amazing achievement of language and to share that achievement e equitably among all of us. And that's, that's, I think, why many of us have gone into language study. Uh, sometimes it's easy to forget that in the, you know, struggle with a particular research study uh, or, or, you know, figuring out a particular, uh, you know, grammatical pattern or uh, syntactic analysis. But this is why we do what we do. And every once in a while, it's important to remind ourselves that that's so. Uh, and I'll, you know, we've gone on too long. We thought we would, wouldn't be able to fill the time. Oh, Kim, we filled the time. Um, so, but maybe there's a few minutes for some discussion and that would be super welcome. Thank you. Yeah, let's thank our speakers for this incredibly insightful talk. And I'll say, yeah, let's take time. Uh, hopefully we all have a lot of questions. I know that they do. So, um, yeah, you can ask in the chat or raise your hands with the reaction, I think. I can't. Um, Darling, Okim, do you want me to moderate or you just wanna give oh, questions okay. as they can? I can, I can do that. Um, someone asked, what if we have the same ethical phrases, for example, American born Asian, oh, like Chinese, Japanese, Korean versus Asian faces who are true foreigners. They came to the USA as students, for example, have same accents. Hmm. Do you have any response, Don? Well, I think that when we cue, when we cue uh, uh, national identity, uh, uh, it doesn't matter whether the face we show is a, uh, you know, uh, 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 an American born uh, Chinese American or Chinese born uh, 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 Chinese speaker, um, the visual cue is the same visual cue. And we, as, as uh, I think we've shown you, we've tried to make sure that any kind of um, peripheral uh, issues like the dress and the pose and the hairstyle, all of those things are equal, which, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, people uh, go to a, uh, um, a country where they are a heritage a visitor and people know immediately that they're Americans. Well, it's because the shoes you wear or the hairstyle or something like that. So we try to make sure that those kinds of cues are missing from our stimuli. I don't think it matters. Do you, okay, I don't think it matters. Well, but, one example is my daughter. <laughs> she was born in Georgia and my son was born in Flagstaff. Sometimes when they start a new school, then oftentimes they think my children don't speak English just looking at their faces. They can't really tell whether they're immediately from Korea or just born here. So usually the first question is some like, do you, do you speak English or, oh, your English is pretty good, you know? Uh, and I actually get that response too. So I don't think like Don mentioned there, uh, minor differences make a big difference. Yeah. I see that Seong Kyung has a hand up, so. Why don't you unmute yourself and... Um, um, thank you so much, Don and Okim. And my name is Yang Kim and I teach here in the department. And what you just talked about is like right like in the center of my own work too, even though I work with usually native speakers. And being a non-native speaker myself, I also have a ton of personal experiences uh, relevant to what you're saying, once some student wrote me on the anonymous evaluation that your accent is too thick, I cannot learn anything from you. 
anyways but there's so many things i want to um share with you or just get some comments from you is that one thing is that um, about the um Levery and taser 2010 study so um there they showed that um the trivia sentences are believed less uh, truthfully when it's spoken by non speakers than their speakers and that is a valid result and but i was actually a bit myself skeptical about their own conclusion where they said that the decreased credibility was due to processing difficulty mm. not stereotyping or prejudice yeah, yeah, yeah. and I what actually i just wrote a um, paper with my um business advisor um it's not published yet but we are trying to submit it in a couple months but there what we actually did was we actually used native speakers only. We just use trivia sentences, native speakers, male versus female. And so there is no question of processing difficulty because they both were California speakers and like perfectly like comprehensible and actually their comprehensible score, comprehensibility scores were the same. But what we found was that when their trivia sentences uh, were um, asked in terms of their credibility. Uh, when the two voices, male voices and female voices, were separate, female voices trivia sentences were actually more believable. Oh. But when the two voices were mixed in the same group so that people can actually compare male voices and female voices in one, one block, male voices trivia sentences were believed more. So it's not even just about native versus not native, this stereotyping and prejudice and all these like information people get from the speech signal and they make use of it is even within like the native speaker population. And like, of course, the um, degree to which things are pan out will be probably bigger in native versus non-native, but for me, theoretically and practically, very similar thing is happening even within quote unquote native population. And another kind of um, thing about my own research is that I not only only look at just offline um, evaluation measures, but I also look at on, like real time online processing and it shows up there too. Like when you show like a smiling face versus non-smiling face with the same exact native sounding speech material people's processing is online processing is just different people respond better to the same speech signal with smiley face and just these things are just all over the place and thank you so much for your work and i just wanted to share some of what I'd be doing or that are relevant to um, your study. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the gender issue is one that we have deliberately avoided. Um, we have, you know, whenever we do these studies, we have all male or all female speakers because we know that gender is a huge, is a huge variable that remains uncharted territory for somebody to look at. Um, the question of whether there's an additive an additive effect of, uh, you know, uh, negatively biasing traits. So that, for example, if a um, um, a person of color who is a African who has an African, say, a Central African accent, suffers more than a um, a, a, a lighter skinned or Caucasian resident of Central Africa with the same accent. Uh, we don't really know what the additive effects are of, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting about the, what, what the word is right now, but you know, the, the combination intersectorial uh, factors, but certainly they're in a, they are powerful. Can, can I ask yeah. a question? Is there another question on yellow? Am I getting in the uh, way? Professor Watson Tharp talked oh, about dual, dual immersion. And oh, I, I, know, I know some of your work, so I'm, I'm, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for this great presentation. There's so much that resonated. But I just wanted to add, because you mentioned it, that that's one of the issues we, we have um, kind of 
um, we're grappling with is that the made of speak ideology very much persists in teacher education because the goal is to get students to bilingualism and biliteracy. And so it's definitely the sense, oh, you know, you have to have native speakers and teaching the children or um, the teachers have to be native speakers to get to that very ambitious goal. But what's interesting is that the children all view each other as learners of you know, two languages mm -hmm. and whatever the constellation is, everybody is learning together in this, especially in the two, in the Spanish classrooms where you have the, the children who are native speakers or, or heritage speakers or whatever we might want to describe them. And they all have the sense that they're moving toward each other in acquiring two languages. And so the kind of native speaker, non-native speaker um, distinctions kind of uh, uh, tend to disappear in that sense that they're all viewing each other as learners, but that's not necessarily the case for the teachers and overcoming the native speaker ideologies. It, that, that still that persists. Could, could, I, could I ask um, you to maybe flesh out um, the, the final comment on your final slide here? Um, I think it's exciting, especially in light of how many students are present today who may be thinking about themselves as um, future scholars um, or future people moving about in the world. Um, I, what I've always admired about your work, um, the work of both of you, is how uh, your commitment to social justice plays out in the work that you do. Um, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how someone goes from, say, being in an undergraduate degree program to um, starting to pursue a research program in these really meaningful ways for them, right? So, so what we have here are just, we have this team of linguists, right? These people with this fantastic linguistics training from uh, many of them from the University of Utah. How do they turn that into making the world a more socially just place? Well, Kim, do you want to take um, a stab at that? Well, I, I'm sure, Don, you could, you could add a lot more um, comprehensible ones. I'm going to just add something quick related to my own personal aspect. Um, I think research is all about, at least that's what I think, because that's how passion starts. All about uh, what, what motivates you uh, uh, in your life. I became a pronunciation scholar because my pronunciation was so bad. I was an immigrant. I immigrated myself at the age of 19 to New Zealand. Um, nobody understood pretty much anything of what I said. I was so scared of buying a chewing gum because I couldn't say gum accurately. Um, then it, I realized instead of complaining about <laughs> um, my own ability, I actually complained about the teacher. I at the time thought I had a bad teacher. I just didn't learn pronunciation properly. And I started with an idea that maybe one day I'm going to train these English teachers properly to teach pronunciation so that a student like me can have benefits. Uh, as time goes by, uh, immigrating myself to America and my husband, you know, the, the picture on the Kang Rubin, uh, one, one of the picture is my husband, by the way. Good and looking, he good has, looking guy. <laughs> He has a very strong accent. And living in the States, I started to feel, I didn't really realize this big in-depth uh, discrimination issues in New Zealand, quite honestly, when I lived there for seven years. But when I came to the States, I started to feel that weird, but unspoken um, bias from listeners, from uh, attitudes, from even at a restaurant, in, you know, and even just a simple phone conversation uh, for the call centers. My, when my husband had to talk about anything related to a product, he never got a full uh, response because he has actually a very strong accent. I started to feel this is just not right. Something has to happen. Then when I learned this, reverse linguistic stereotype or this unique research paradigm from Don, it directly struck me like, oh, 
there is something that I could do even as a applied linguist. Uh, and I, I don't know, Don, whether you remember, I told Don after I finished my PhD, I said, what do I do? I'm not a, you know, the scientist saving the, I mean, developing a vaccine or anything. I'm just a applied linguist. Like, what do I do? Well, like a linguist is not saving the world. And he actually told me, this is an example. You change the people's perspectives, you know? It was a huge uh, enlightening message that I think whatever we feel become your research topic eventually, if you have that passion and motivation. I don't know, that's how I feel, Don. That's how I got motivated. Good story. I could maybe say a word from the perspective of a white male privileged person, uh, although our, the executive order I mentioned before, you're not allowed to use that word anymore, but uh, this is not federally funded, so I guess I can, I can talk about privilege. Um, for a person who is a native speaker of English uh, and a white person, uh, one thing that I've learned is how ubiquitous and how powerful and unconscious are the forces that move me towards biased perceptions and biased um, uh, evaluations of people. And I will always be subject to those biases. I don't believe, you know, when, my, when I teach intercultural communication, or I used to teach, before they took my teaching license away, I used to teach intercultural communication. Um, and, um, you know, my students here in Georgia would always say, well, I'm not biased, I'm not prejudiced. Um, but of course, we're all prejudiced, and especially those of us who can live our lives with few, um, few costs for exercising our biases. So one thing this research has taught me is that I'm not going to escape my bias, and my biases are no less virulent than anybody else's. But re that recognition is, is an empowering recognition, and it enables me moment by moment to think about why am I reacting this way and how can I be proactive in, in trying to minimize the impact of my immediate biased reaction. Uh, and in fact, how can I maybe turn that around 180 degrees and celebrate the fact that this person is speaking so differently from me and maybe I don't understand every word, but if I work hard enough, I can extract meaning. Uh, which is what you know what we're all about anyway is trying to extract meaning so from my perspective i think uh learning about this and um uh making these processes more transparent is personally very helpful because it gives me more tools and and, and greater strength in fighting the incessant uh you know tendency that we all have towards bias and we could spend hours talking about why why we have those biases at some point in human evolution there there was some functionality to recognizing who's in your clan and who's not in your clan but we're no longer in, we're no longer in neanderthal times and what may have been functional from an evolutionary point of view at one point is no longer functional for 21st century humans uh, but still we all have that evolutionary uh, trait that's that's embedded in us. Uh, so how do we fight that? Um, this research helps helps gives me some tools for doing that. And uh, you know, uh, Dr. Hayes Harb talked about as as undergraduates moving into careers as researchers. Let me just say that you know I don't think that in or, that to be a good person you have to be a university researcher. I think that, but you do have to be a searcher. And search again, which makes you a researcher. In your life, you are a researcher because you search and you search again. And so every day in our lives, we conduct little experiments. What would happen if I acted this way? What would happen if I thought this way? What would happen if I responded that way? And to do that systematically makes you a researcher in your life. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of you, I hope, will, you know, uh, want to become my clone and, <laughs> and become a, a social scientist. Uh, but most of you will not. Uh, but most of you still need to think of yourselves as deliberate 
intentional researchers in your daily life, running little experiments, little social psychological experiments, socio linguistic experiments about how to increase inclusivity because, you know, well, the motivation is that it makes you live in a more just world, but it also enriches your life as well. That was a little long winded, sorry. Oh, thank you. It was great. Um, anybody has some last minute question? Or not last minute? There are some comments here. Hmm. Okay. Um, then I will join me in thanking our speakers again for a very insightful talk. I'm incredibly grateful. Um, and if you're a student and you want to stick around, our speakers have very nicely agreed to spend some time just with you. So stick around.